Tonight's guest is Caden Womack. Caden, welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. Well, it's great having you on. Thank you for your time. Caden, please give us a brief bio on yourself. I am a 28-year-old computer engineer. I'm living in the Midwest, more Western hemisphere of the United States currently in the mountainous region. I spent a lot of time growing up in Alaska, and where this story takes place is specifically in the southeast Alaska, where the ice fields kind of meet up with the mountain range at the back end of town and spill over into the glaciers that you can actually see from Juneau, Alaska. You think the western mountain ranges are about as ideal of a place for dogmen as there is. Why do you think that? I think the foresty regions would be a great habitat for these sorts of creatures, given its natural cover, the abundance of wildlife that is needed to sustain the caloric intake of a creature like this, as well as these more heavily wooded mountainous terrains are harder for us to build modern infrastructure into. And so it's more of a natural resource that they can continue to exist in. I think there's a lot of benefit to these sorts of more wildernessy type places that are a bit away from the buzz of humanity. Because I think these things are probably, if not more so, conscious of us than we are of them. And as a species, I imagine they would take steps to avoid our like immediate detection to their presence for, I don't know, maybe fear of retaliation or people trying to find them for scientific research and you know, just messing up the general flow of their life. Like they, as much as anything else, just wants to exist and continue to do its thing and hunt its hunting grounds and live undisturbed. Unfortunately, I think you're right. They are a lot more conscious of us than we are of them. So, you know, like I said, that's not a good thing. Your encounter happened in Juneau, Alaska, like you said. What can you tell us about the place? Juneau, Alaska is the capital city of Alaska, but for being a capital city, it is relatively small. It itself is uh, landlocked. The only ways in is through boat and plane. And that's not for it necessarily being an island, but because on the border to the inland side of it is mountain ranges and about 500 miles of ice fields. I mean, you, I guess, technically could cross it, but if for any sane person, they recognize that you just simply cannot cross that. And it's a relatively quiet place, lots of nature, lots of hiking trails, lots of outdoorsy things to do, which was great for me and my family. We're the outdoorsy sorts. We like our camping, we like our hunting and fishing and you know, outdoor survival. Me uh, running trails around town wasn't uncommon, especially after I got my first vehicle and <laughs> had the means to get out to the different trailheads myself. And that's what I was doing this particular day. I've been to several places in Alaska, but never been to Juneau. It sounds like a beautiful place, though, and you're kind of making me want to visit it. It's gorgeous. It's a great place to visit. Yeah, sounds like it. I would highly recommend especially if you um if you like cabins um you, you have to book in advance but the shrine of saint Teresa, out uh past it's like around 34 mile um beautiful place uh they've got some cabins that overlook the water and are tucked up into the forest and some really well-maintained gardens strongly recommend yeah sounds beautiful you were living with your dad at the time of your encounter did you have any reservations about sharing it with him I think for me personally, I would say, no, I don't have any reservations. I don't have any necessary like ill thoughts about the encounter. And I think that the only reservations I would have in sharing the information about these creatures is that it would encourage people who want to like find these things to spend more time looking for them, looking for their signs, what sort of things. And, and I would say it's okay to understand what's out there and to be wary of it, but actively pursuing something like this instead of recognizing its sounds and taking a measure of avoidance could be very risky to somebody. We don't 
particularly know what happens if you stumble onto this thing's den or wherever it resides and it decides to take up a defensive stance towards you because based on the one i saw i could not have fought this thing off if it had any interest in me whatsoever and a lot of the research i'd done after my encounter was from a perspective of wanting to understand the greater scope of what i'd seen and also how to understand what to caution myself and others towards when traveling alone in the wilderness it's safe to say that no one could fight one of these things off without a lot of help. <laughs> yeah, so. I, yep, I agree. Yes, yeah, not just you. <laughs> <laughs> you were living with your dad at the time. What were his opinions on the existence of cryptids like Dogmen and Sasquatch? So I was living with my dad at the time, and actually, I think this would have been like right after I moved out of his place. But I was in Alaska with my dad, and it was something that we didn't talk about too terribly much. I think he was on the skeptical nature of, I would rather not believe. And my stepmom was very much in the nature of, I believe there's truth to every superstition. And so a lot of the times I would talk about these things, I would usually talk about it to my stepmom. And she uh, is an Alaska native woman. And she very much took the stance of, it's good to understand, but not to poke. That's a good way to put it. And I can understand why your dad didn't want to believe in their existence because yeah, it's a lot easier to head into the woods when you don't believe that dogmen or Sasquatch are out there, but guess what? They are. What were your thoughts on their existence before you had that experience? I mean, to a degree, I would say life-altering. Um, not world-shattering, but I'd always kind of been... You know, I'm a scientist by nature, and I think it is in my ways to question and to seek answers and understanding of. And that was one of the first moments where I had what well, I had felt like I was a young adult and had learned enough of what I needed to to get by. And seeing something like that moving the way it did, and I was like, wow. I really don't understand a lot about this nature stuff. And I mean, that's not to say that like I didn't understand like natural medicines or like how to make a makeshift splint or how to make your way through the woods or track or try to make less of a track or not make as much noise while you're running, which does come into play later in the story. But there were still a lot of unknowns and this was a big eye opening to there are unknowns and there are things that we may only see in glimpses and in passing once for our lives, but that doesn't deny their existence. And that doesn't discredit the experience of myself and all the other people who have seen these things throughout the world. Oh, you're right. Yeah, it definitely doesn't discredit it. If you've had a dog man encounter and would like to speak with me about it, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. If you've had a Bigfoot sighting and would like to be a guest on one of my two Bigfoot shows, please go to mybigfootsighting.com and let me know. All right, Caden, please tell us about your encounter now. Give us every last detail that comes to mind. Yeah, this was early May, probably like May 7th to 10th-ish, 2013 in the morning time no later than 8.30, I'd have to say. I'd already been on the trail running up this way. So I'll uh, go ahead and give a brief description of Juno and get back a little bit. It is a very foresty, mountainous region, temperate rainforest with, especially in the spring and summertime, a, a traditionally very heavy rainfall. And in the uh, frosted earths kind of up, towards the mountains as it's coming off of that winter into late spring, there's still sometimes a lot of that like dampness to the ground. And so there are these old trails through the forest that are on like um, wooden planks that are kind of moored down into the mud so that they don't sink too far, but they are kind of sunken into the mud a bit. And a lot of the trails I would go to run on 
would be these wider trails that would lead up to these wooden pathways. And at the time, this particular week had been pretty dry. And so I felt comfortable knowing that I wasn't going to sink into the mud. But it was kind of like it rained the previous night. Not super heavy, but enough to where there was still a little bit of softness to the top side of the earth. But based on like how dry it had been, it wasn't like super murky. And I was wearing... I had this uh this weighted vest and ankle set because I uh I was training to see if I could get into a, a firefighter academy and I wanted to synthesize the uh weight of the gear that I'd be carrying so it was like a uh, 75 pounds on the vest I had like 15 pounds on each arm like on my wrists and then I had an extra 20 pounds per leg on my ankles and I would go jog these trails. And so that's why I was always worried about sinking into the mud is I'm not the lightest person on earth. And when you're wearing that extra hundred pounds or so, it takes a lot to not sink into those soft spots of the earth. And so I was excited to pursue this trail that I had come up to the, like the wooden path trailhead and always turned around and went back to my car. And so once it gets onto those sort of like wooden paths, the tree cover tends to become much more dense. These trails not being used nearly as much. They tend to be a little bit more forested over low hanging tree branch types. Sometimes these big trees get blown over in storms. So usually you don't have trees laying across the path, but you have trees that will lay next to it. And so there were a number of those kind of mossy, kind of cool, damp, you know, it was a nice run. It was like nice and shady early morning. Sun's kind of coming up to greet the day. It's looking like a nice day. Nothing too out of the ordinary. And I'm like making my way up towards the ridge where the ridge like overlooks the glacier and then like kind of sweeps down to where the V of the ice comes through. And if you look at a picture of the Mendenhall Glacier, you can see where it kind of points in towards the river. And there's like a rock ridge up on the left side. And that's where I was, as I was in the forest running towards that rock ridge. And I could tell I was getting to a higher elevation by the uh, kind of the way the air was thinning. And I could feel the coolness of it as the wind blows it off the ice. Now, wind itself is a balance of temperature. As the different molecules are moving through the space, the warmer ones and the colder ones are going to collide to create friction and want to balance. And whichever one has the stronger thermal force is going to win the direction that the wind blows. And so it was kind of doing this back and forth where the cold air would rush off the glacier into the forest. And then the warm forest air would roll up from behind me towards the glacier. And it was in one of those humid swells of warmer air behind me that I started to smell something. And it smelled like like a dead animal like rotten fat, um, like curded cheese left in a bag to sit in the sun. And I was very confused because I had just run from that direction and I hadn't smelled anything leading up to it. I hadn't noticed any signs of, you know, like a carcass or something. It wasn't like super marshy, and so I didn't think like an animal got stuck in the mud and then like died or anything. It was very out of place in this moment. And so I think that kind of set my hairs on end. And I slowed from like my jogged pace to, you know, sort of a walk and turned around to look. And I didn't see anything. So I gave another sniff, and it was pungent whatever had been making this scent smelled significantly closer. And so then I started thinking this might be an animal, like a bear or something got into whatever it got into. And, you know, is now the rotting viscera on its fur is making a presence. And so I'm like looking into the trees, like, can I see anything? Can I hear anything? And when I focused into it, I I did hear snapping of like tree brushes and the lower foliage of like the 
the skunk cabbage and the devil's club just being like shoved aside as something big was moving through. And so I'm thinking this is a bear. It's running after me. Bears can run like a good 30 miles an hour. And so I, I dip off the, the trail and I, I took off my, uh, my arm weights first. Cause I was thinking if I have to climb this tree, I don't want my arms restricted. And so I, t- I take these arm weights off and I drop them down and I'm like looking out to the trail and what burst through wasn't a bear. It was a deer first. I, I want to say like four point buck, you know, sizable deer wasn't the biggest I'd ever seen, but you know, a good, a good buck. And it is just like full force running does not care about any lick of what sound it's making and it bounds out from like the side of this uh, foliage kicks off the trail itself and there was like a a tree laying lengthwise in the mud on the far side of the trail where it came over and it like springboarded off the trail over this tree and like back into the underbrush and i was sitting there and i'm like well that's not what i expected and i went to like stand and like peer around this tree but something deep inside me that survival instinct that says no don't stay in place just took over and i was frozen in spot and i'm glad i didn't stand because i not even two seconds after this thing this like massive dark shape comes hurtling out of the mid upper tree branches like 15 20 feet up in the air at a diagonal downward trajectory four limbs two of them outstretched in front of it and it catches that log that the deer just bounded over and launched itself after this thing i was completely shocked but i did get a pretty good look at its side profile this thing was long canine uh based on the way that the hips were mounted and the uh, the front legs kind of curled forward and then eventually in and up to its chest when it did its spring, I, I could definitely see this thing as being a bipedal creature, even though I hadn't myself seen it stand on its two legs. I saw it in a full-blown sprint. The hair, it was like a black, brownish red, very disheveled i think it was a black furred creature that was covered in mud and dried blood like you know when dried blood in the iron turns to that like brownie oxidized color it was very much that but present in like patches throughout the fur all up on its where its forearms would have been around the mouth and the chest area like a not particularly clean eater. And when this thing was in my visibility, that scent was enough to make me gag if I had been breathing in that time. But it, full service, all of my functions were stopped in that moment. It was just survival panic. It had a wide, like wide shoulders and these long, 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 um dark muscular arms that had four taloned or clawed fingers i guess taloned isn't the right word but like thick muscular fingers with like these uh claws on it that could be depicted for either piercing or slashing or like holding something down while it like latched into it with its teeth and in this application it used them to catch and grip the log and then pull itself kind of up to the log. And while it did so, its hind legs came up to its chest and put its like the balls of its feet, like right in between where its palms would be. And then it launched its front limbs backwards while it kicked off with its hind legs and just shot into the forest like a bullet. The speed was incredible, just almost incomprehensible, way faster than that deer was moving. and. I knew it was gone and it was moving away, but I I knew I had to get out of there. And so I already had the arm weights down. 
it was going to take too long to take the leg weights off because I would have to take my shoes off first. And so I just dumped the jacket on the ground, the the vest. I just unzipped, uh, unlatched, and dumped it. And I started running. And I didn't I didn't run directly on the uh, the wood path itself. I was running kind of in the dirt and like jumping from like uh, over pronounced root to over pronounced root. Uh, so that my boots wouldn't make that hollow thunk, 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 thunk sound on the wood as I ran. And I actually <laughs> eventually kind of veered off the trail and went straight towards where I knew that ridge would be. And I, I decided to run forward to get out of here, even though it went into deeper forest, because this thing was between me and the trail to leave. So I figured I'm just going to have to hike another way down out of here and plan an extra four hours to my day i made it you know when you're when your feet pounding and heart pumping and your your body's just trying to get oxygen i think i had like five solid breaths maybe 15 good steps before i hear the cry out of this elk as it was captured and it was you know like a pained dying scream like death was in the air like i i knew that deer was not making it out of that fight alive and i was just i was so grateful for it for being there to give its life so that i had a distraction to get away i made it to the face of the glacier and i climbed down the rocks that were off to that left side i had to do a little bit of swimming to get to a different uh, beach section when I did eventually get down. And I I eventually made my way back to where the loading bay for the river rafts was. And then from there was able to hike back up to the trailhead where my truck was. And it did take me several extra hours. And this whole time I was just trying to process what I'd seen and what I'd smelled. And it didn't even dawn on me that I'd left my weighted vest and arm guard things behind until i was basically home and i was like crap (laughs) those were expensive and so the next couple of days i i told the story to my friend group and of course all of them are as skeptical as boys are and they're like oh sure that's definitely what you saw there was a, a big black wolf up in mendenhall named romeo and uh, a couple of my friends were trying to convince me that's what I saw. They were like, oh, you just saw Romeo. Romeo was out hunting. And I'm like, mm, Romeo ain't eight feet long, bro. So eventually, a couple days later, we did get a party together to go up there and look. And <laughs> as silly as it was, we were we armed ourselves to the teeth going into this. So we had long rifles. We had pistols. We had shotguns. Like We were kit up for you know, whatever sort of encounter we might come up against. And I think it was probably a little startling to, uh, there was a biker that was coming out of the trail when we were like going up it (laughs) for him to just be leaving and see a group of teenage boys walking into the woods armed to the teeth. (laughs) And so we're going up this trail and my friends keep pointing to every laid over tree and they're like, Oh, is this the one? Is this the one? I'm like, I don't know guys. Let's, find the vest and then once we have the vest i can point out the tree and so we were on this trail a good ways i I hadn't realized how far up i actually had been just because i was zoned out doing my jog the the time before but we went up pretty high and found the vest and my arm guards laying in the mud and so we grabbed those and backtracked to where that fallen over tree had been and we uh were looking over the top of it and we see these eight gouge marks, maybe three quarters an inch to an inch and a half thick, depending on which incision it was. But there was four per side, eight in total of these marks where it had like gripped the log. And then in the in-between where it had kicked off, the bark was like splintered off from the force of something launching pretty hard. And it was looking at those that my friend started to give more validity to my story and we're we smelt around and i was like if it was here we could smell it like you guys would know i would know i'm not forgetting that smell it it smelled like wet meat like rancid fat 
and wet meat. I don't, I don't know how a creature gets to smelling like that, but it was pungent. You know, we didn't smell it for this bit. And so we were like, well, let's go into the, the forest more. And as we followed the trajectory of where this thing launched, we actually found the deer's path. We found its tracks. We found the broken branches from where it had shoved its way through things. There was a antler gouge mark where it had like pushed its way through like a patch of, I don't know if you know what skunk cabbage is, but they're these big, long leaflet things. And it looked like it had tore a chunk of the skunk cabbage with its antlers. It was trying to like rampage its way through. And we, we find it's not like a clearing. It's just like a slight break in the trees. And there's like dried blood on the tree and dried blood on the moss, dried blood on like a variety of sticks strewn throughout the area. There's a number of like leg bones laying on the ground that looks like they've been like chewed on all the meat completely stripped and certain animals will like bite through the bones to get into the marrow inside. And that's what these ones were like. They were crunched to like get every bit of sustenance out of this thing. But it was only, we only found the bones to like one leg. We found the bones and a lot of blood. So we were all like, well, where's the rest of the deer? (laughs) And to this day, we don't know for certain, but we're pretty confident that it, took the rest of it back for either a midnight snack or maybe this was a mother and it had younglings to feed or your guess is as good as mine but we never found the rest of that deer and after finding the leg all destroyed like that my friends and i were happy enough to leave i got the vest that i had come for and they all got the proof to my story and i don't think any of us really went running that trail or up that side of the ice fields again. And I certainly never went solo, not to that area, at least. Can't say I blame you for not wanting to go solo out there after an experience like that. Wow. When that dog man jumped down onto that log and sprung off in pursuit of the deer, did it ever seem to notice you being there? You know, I feel like something traveling at that sort of speed, being able to hunt with that sort of precision, I can't imagine that it didn't know I was there. But as far as a caloric intake between a hiker and an adult deer, like if I was the dog man, I'd pick the deer every time. But it didn't like necessarily look at me. It didn't slow down as much. I did get the profile of its eye, at least the side of its right eye because it was kind of forward facing eye structure similar to that of a dog i couldn't tell you much the color based on the distance and the fact that i was trying to take in the details of the rest of it but i if i were to make a guess i'd probably have to say like brown or amber or red but it didn't it didn't feel the need to take notice to me and so if it did notice me i wasn't able to tell I'm pretty sure you're right. I'm pretty sure that it knew you were there, but it didn't really matter to it. It had business to dole out, so he had just continued on and dispatched the deer. Was it holding its ears up, or were they pinned back? Pinned back. Pinned back, and I think this is probably because of the way it was moving through the branches. And this is something that Earlier, you'd asked if I did some research on it after the fact, and the answer to that question is yes, most definitely. And I found several examples of different dogman sightings within the Western Hemisphere of like Colorado up through Alaska, where these things are in heavily forested areas. And I think, personally, a reason that we likely don't see very many tracks for these things is because they don't move on the ground. I think they move through the trees and having your ears pinned back would be easier for jumping from branch to branch without having to worry about your ears getting whipped by a stray branch or anything. Those are really good points about the ears protecting them and also a way of traveling without revealing your presence. So I'll bet you're right on both counts. Did you ever notice if it had a tail on it? Um, not particularly. If it did have a tail, it would have curled with the legs. 
I could see a creature like this having one for balance reasons, especially if it is leaping from tree to tree, but most of its momentum seemed to be carried by its front, the front part of its body with power from the hind legs being used to accent the jump. It happened very fast. And I, I'd originally taken in the whole side profile and was like, that's a wolf. And then it grabbed the log and I thought maybe not. And so I was looking at, you know, the head structure. I was looking at the color of the fur, the anatomy of the, of the paws. Um, the tail didn't strike me as a, um, as like a particularly memorable component. Cause I like even picturing it, I have my eyes closed and I'm trying to picture the moment of this thing coming down from the tree and pulling the legs up. Yeah, actually thinking about it now, I do think when it pulled its legs up there, it could have been a tail, but at that point I wasn't quite looking at its back as much as I was watching it bring its feet to its chest and springboard off of this log at God knows how fast. So very possibly having a tail would make sense for this sort of creature. I wonder if it keeps it like tucked in for the similar purpose of protecting your ears when you're jumping like that. Maybe it tucks its tail as well. It just might, it's hard to say. When it came down out of the trees and landed on that log, was it more of a controlled crash or did it seem to be totally under control of its body? It seemed to be aiming for it. Like it had launched itself from an upper branch and that was its next springboard location. It didn't fumble. It was very graceful. It was very precise in its movement even to the point of like bringing its feet up to its chest while still in the air so that it was ready to spring as soon as its chest had like rotated itself off of the upper arm extension enough to accent the throw. Cause it was, it was slingshotting itself with the upper body and using its lower body to pounce off of the object in question. And I, it went upwards. And so I was thinking because the trail runs there, the trees weren't close enough for it to jump from branch to branch. And so it aimed for a large target that was on the ground so that it could springboard itself back up into a larger tree to get verticality over its prey. I wouldn't say it was a crash at all. It sure is amazing how they do a lot of the things that they do. And on that note, I remember mentioning this in the, in the written brief. I know I saw it. I know I heard the scream of the elk. I heard the crashing of the branches as the elk charged through. But when this thing came out of the trees and when it landed on the log and I saw it grab and push off the log, I'm still not sure I heard this creature make a sound. It was unearthly quiet. And I I think that speaks to the level of control that it had in this leap. Oh, sure. Yeah, to do that so quietly, it would have to be under total control. So, yeah, I'd say you're right about that. How far do you think you were from it in the deer when you heard it catch it? Like 30, 35 yards. I'll bet it seemed like it was right next to you. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, 30 yards isn't that much of a distance when you get down to it. No, not at all. You told us about the mud and what looked like might have been blood in its fur, but outside of that, did it seem to be in good health or was it in rough shape? I mean, it seemed to be in pretty good health. Uh, It seemed, I would guess, adult, uh, mature adults. I couldn't tell you for battle scars because I didn't get a close look at this thing or um, that, but the fur itself seemed a bit disheveled, but not like mangy. Like a creature that probably rolls around in the dirt a lot or in, you know, whatever else may permeate its den, as evident of what I could only assume to be dried viscera in its coat. It wasn't a particularly clean animal. I don't think it necessarily cared too much for cleanliness. I don't think that necessarily bothered it or inhibited its ability to hunt. If anything, 
it would probably make that sort of scent uh, if it was a commonality in these creatures, which I see uh, conflicting reports on constantly, but that usually ends up being based on the region. And this was something I thought about after our previous conversation is maybe the smell and that gathering food for younglings, maybe that was like specific to a maternal dogman creature like a, a mother that like has to be known in an area and has to like establish which region is hers so that others don't come and try to compete in her territory for a food source between like her and her young. Cause you know, these things would have a massive caloric intake. And so I thought maybe it was something like that. Maybe it's the process of covering yourself in blood is some sort of mating ritual to these things. But I don't know, I just I just always thought messy eater and doesn't bathe <laughs> tends to lead to the, the smell of rot. But there was never a smell that I've more closely assigned with imminent danger than what I'd smelled that day. Yeah, I can understand why you would say that. It sounds like you didn't see any genitalia. Is that accurate? That's accurate. I did not see any strong depiction of gender on this particular creature. I didn't think you did. Did it give you the impression that it was just a flesh and blood creature that was out there making a living the best way it knew how, or did it seem to be a demonic entity from the gates of hell? I would have to say natural creature. I've had encounters with other things that felt more spiritual in their nature. This definitely just felt like one of those many mysteries of Alaska. One of those creatures that has been around for way longer than I can comprehend and may have been misinterpreted by cultures through time. But it seemed like a flesh and blood creature that was hunting because it needed to. That could very easily be what was going on there. Your friends seemed to come around at least a little bit when they saw the claw marks in the log. Did they ever totally come around though and definitely believe you? My friend Ed did eventually later. He had a, uh, what he described as he smelled it in the mountains and it reminded him of my story and he hightailed it out of there quick. And he said he never saw it, but after he saw the claw marks and my description of the smell and he'd smelled it, he said he's a believer. But I don't know if Ed ever went back and looked or tried to find more evidence, but a lot of my friends, they kind of were all very much of that there's more to life than we fully understand. And they know that I am a man of science and a man of credibility. And I wouldn't just make something up baselessly, nor would I just drop my weights off in the woods for several days for a gag. So I think they kind of understood the severity of what I was feeling and were willing to go along with that if they didn't end up fully believing themselves but something ate that deer, and they can't deny that. It's good they know you wouldn't hoax something like that. You were in a relationship with a native woman at the time of that encounter. Was she much help when it came to you dealing with it? Um, not really. (laughs) Well, that's not good. So when you told her about it, did she rebuff you and refuse to believe that you're telling the truth, or did she believe you but just didn't help you much? I mean, it was more of believed me, but just didn't really help much. Didn't have much to go off of as far as like what legends it could have been. And so I'd read through like a number of the different books of folklore and stuff. And I actually still have a copy of one of those books. It's called Spirit of the Raven. It's a collection of short stories. And in it, it talks about a dog spirit who protects the wilderness and protects ancient hidden burial sites, which I think could be credible. You know, the Native Americans have been here a lot longer, and there's a lot of legends that span through multiple Native cultures that are very close to, like even on the Eastern Plains versus the Western Plains, both societies have stories of large birds that came around and then thunderstorms followed. They have stories of different 
bipedal dog-like creatures throughout the expanse of North America. I've heard reports in center of Mexico. I've heard them all the way up through Alaska and Canada. The Alaska natives, a lot of their stories of bipedal hairy creatures are more in line with like the otter men that live in the waterways and can mirror people's cries and calls for help from loved ones. And so she she had tried to tell me that it may be something like that. And the descriptor just never really felt right. And so it kind of, for me, it was very much a, I think asking her for information is going to be a bit of a dead end. And so I turned to more sources on the internet, books of legend, books of folklore. My older brother was very into studying history and legends and like the spirits behind those sorts of legends. And so I'd go to my brother for assistance, but you know, it sounds like she did what she could to help, but unfortunately just couldn't render much help. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not going to fault her for it. Oh no, no, she did what she could. It's going to be hard to quantify it, but how strongly exactly were you affected by that experience? Um, for a time, I was definitely very unnerved. I didn't want to go camping alone. A lot of my runs turned into like much more open and civilized areas. Like instead of running by the glacier, I started uh, going out to Auk Bay and I would park and run along the roadside and like watch the sunrise over the ocean and just being much more populated manned spaces. I did still go out to the glacier sometimes, but not so much out to that path as much. I would go to like the other sides of the glacier and I'd usually go with groups of people and stick to the more touristy areas where there's like a pretty well beaten path that leads out to this waterfall. And, you know, I'd go out there and I'd draw for a while, but I kind of avoided the deep woods a lot more than I had previously for a while I was skeptical of what I had seen and I thought maybe I was going crazy. And then I'd found it was like a blog post of this guy who was talking about a very similar encounter with a similar creature who smelled very similarly in Yellowstone in Montana. And it was when I found that, that I was like, well, duh, why haven't I been checking the internet? And so I'd started doing a lot more research online and, you know, I found reports of clean dogmen that don't smell nearly as fragrantly like in the eastern United States and like Kansas, Kentucky, like weaving through the cornfields. I'd found people talking about is it the dogman, is it the chupacabra in like sightings in the mountains of northern Mexico? There was a, a lot of sightings in the Rocky Mountains and in the national forests within like the stretch of the Rockies of Idaho and into Montana. I haven't really heard too much of dogmen out of like California. I thought maybe the redwoods would be a good place for these, but not so much. Maybe the trees are too tall. Maybe it's too common a, a visual attraction. Maybe they're out there and I just haven't found the right video or article on it, but I haven't seen too much in, in that region. I haven't heard too much in like the main deserty places like New Mexico or Western Texas. It seems to be where a lot of these sightings are is mountainous regions to the Northern hemisphere of the North Americas and following the mountain ranges down on the East coast into like more of a farmland type. But I think you'd probably have a better map of sightings than what I've put together. I used to have like a board with the United States map on it. And I'd put pins in like all to the different sighting locations. And I'd use like different colored pins for different descriptions and characteristics of like, whether it was the smelly disheveled dog man, or whether it was a clean one. And if, if you've seen the always sunny in Philadelphia, the Pepe Silvia with all of the, in the mail room, I was starting to feel like that. And so I took it down and, <laughs> Yeah, I can understand why you would take it down. 
But at least you got back on the horse. It might have taken you a while to head back into the deeper forest, but eventually you did do that, so that's a good thing. As long as you can say that you're making progress like that, then that's definitely a yeah. good thing. Yeah, I mean, it's been 10 years since I've seen it, and I haven't seen or smelled anything like it since, and it was an 18 years before this encounter, so by that math, I still got another 8 years of playing in the woods before I find another one. I hope it just never happens. If you'd like to be able to listen to the show without ads and have full access to bonus content, that's an option. To find out how, please go to dogmanencounters.com forward slash podcast. You're not just a dogman eyewitness, Caden. You've seen other cryptids, too. Please expand on that for us. Yeah, I've seen a couple other types of cryptids. Multiple sightings of like the same kind, which would be this tall, pale, bipedal creature, long arms, thinnish, small profile of a head comparative to the rest of its body. Fast, very fast, much more aggressive towards humans, much more actively pursuant of humans. Uh, I'd seen that creature twice, and both the times were in Idaho. And actually, after I'd mentioned so, I went back to the spillway where I'd seen my most recent encounter and realized how much closer the spillway was to where I saw the other ones years ago. So it's kind of in the same region, north of Ashton, a little bit east. And um, the first one, I was very young. Do you want me to jump into the, the story here? I'll tell you what. Go ahead and hang on to those stories because you said that you'd be interested in coming on My Paranormal Experience and sharing those experiences, correct? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I can talk about those there and happy to share my experiences. Great. Well, yeah, I'd love to record that show with you as well. When we spoke about those two encounters you just mentioned in Idaho for the first time, you told me that you think they might have been skinwalkers. Is that what you still think they were? Yeah. I thought that was the case. What else have you run into? Um, I was in the uh, Colorado mountains at a uh, friend's cabin when we saw a, a creature that looked like it had a stag antlers on a uh, man's like body and head. It seemed bigger than like a normal man and it no discernible face features that we could make out. In fact, it almost looked like a blank shadowy sheet over this thing's face, but very, very clear detail on the musculature on like the body, like the upper body and the arms. Uh, It was standing kind of on a hill, but like where the light of the hill was behind it. And so we couldn't really see the legs too much, but we could tell it was watching us. It was watching us just stared for a while didn't move we didn't move we just kind of stared back for a while it hung heavy in the air um like it wasn't happy that we were there but it wasn't like attacking us or like trying to come after us the cabin we were in was like an old wood cabin that didn't have any windows and so we locked it up pretty tight that night and i don't know whether it was paranoia wind or something else but we kept the remainder of the couple of days that we were out at that camp we kept hearing like scratching at the walls like something checking our perimeter. And uh, yeah, after like two, three nights of that, we, cause we both woke up one night and we're like, we're looking at each other. We're hearing the scratching again. And we're like, nah, we're not doing this again. We locked eyes and we both knew we were leaving in the morning. <laughs> and so we, uh, we woke up early the next morning, packed our bags and just left. Don't blame me for leaving. You mentioned this upper body. Does that mean it was standing bipedally? Yeah. Yeah. It was in the distance. Like we couldn't see the lower half of the body, but we could see like about where like the upper midriff of your stomach and like the chest and like where the shoulders would hang. And so it looked like a tall bipedal nude form, blank face, antlers. Antlers, blank face, standing bipedally. Does that mean you think that that might have been a Wendigo? Maybe. I never had a name for that one. So. I hope that's not what it was, but 
if that is what it was, then yeah, that's not good. Yeah, you know what? That that looks kind of similar to what we saw. The wide shoulders, musculature, arms. Um, the face was shrouded in darkness because uh, it was staring like directly at where we would have been. But yeah, I'll uh, I'll have to do some more research on the Wendigo. From the way you describe it, it sounds to me like that just might be what it was. I hope that's not the case, but... Yeah, looking at these pictures, I'm I'm hoping that's not what it was, too. <laughs> I'll bet. You've already agreed to come on My Paranormal Experience and talk about that Wendigo encounter and the two encounters you had with those skinwalkers, so we're all set for that. For the people listening who want to listen to that episode, I'm going to post a link for it in the description for tonight's episode of Dogman Encounters here. That way it'll be really easy to find and listen to. But having said that, it's about time for us to get out of here. But before we do, do you have any closing comments you'd like to share? Um, I would say, like I mentioned at the beginning, uh, to anyone who's had an encounter or thinks they may have had an encounter and they're looking for information, I would strongly urge you to not going into the woods and looking for these things. I think they very much want to be left to their own devices, and they are not interfering with humanity on a grand scale. I think any sort of interactions that they do have with people are people who are overexposed in dangerous places, people who are ill-equipped to go looking for these things who do, and people who may have information that these creatures don't want to get out. We don't know how smart they are, but we know that they're smart enough to hide their tracks. We know that they're, you know, at least genetically keyed in in such a way to be discreet with their movements, be discreet with their sound. This is a creature that doesn't necessarily want to be found by us. So I express the strongest caution for anyone who does feel the need to go out to search, but I would say my advice is to not go look. Well, that's really good advice. Caden, I can't thank you enough for coming on and sharing the details of that experience with us. I really appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. I appreciate you having me on your show. Well, you know you're welcome. Thanks again so much, and have a great night.